Welcome to Dr. Roger and Friends, the bright side of longevity, hosted by three peas in a podcast, Doc Roger, Teresa, and Danielle. Thanks for joining us for Coffee and Conversation. Well, welcome, everybody. This is a special edition of The Bright Side of Longevity. Very special, I think. Well, they're all special, right, Danielle? But Danielle and I are uh, are alone today. Uh, Teresa is off, but we're going to spotlight Danielle today. Um, I have a new nickname for Danielle. I call her COVID Bloom <laughs> because... <laughs> Because where everyone else was maybe, you know, feeling sorry for themselves and beating, beating themselves up and complaining about what they couldn't do. She found out what she could do and uh, and had been doing, but did it at a much higher rate. Anyway, um, today uh, we're going to uh, spotlight uh, Danielle's remarkable trilogy, The Data Collectors, a trilogy. That's right. That's three books, three novels. In case you didn't know what trilo- uh, trilogy meant, and yes, in this time she has turned all that around. I guess you had it in your head before COVID, right? You had started. I know maybe you were almost finished with the first one, but two and three just went boom, right? No, uh, I tell people the first uh, the first book was five and a half years in the making. The second one six months. The third one around four months, but they were all published and written for the most part within about a year. In print and print audio. ebook and audiobook. Wow. The audio is so much fun playing with the character voices. <laughs> so you didn't waste your time, did you, Daniel? Well, let me t- let me just a little more of an intro. Danielle, you got to know her in this podcast, but she is a remarkable, remarkable woman. She is she is disciplined, she is committed. She is dedicated to certain themes that I think our society need more than ever. Uh, I, I know she and her husband, John, very well, and they've been in their home and uh, their lives reflect her, uh, her work, her professionalism, and she is really a joy to be with. And she is so eclectic. I mean, it isn't just about the right side of longevity or, or uh, healthy longevity. It's about the world and what's facing us in the world. It's about the humanism. It is about uh, even you have other uh, spe- uh, specific credentials. Didn't you get something with the Florida wildlife? I was, I am a Florida master naturalist. And we just said how you just got nationally certified as a, a nationally board certified health and wellness coach. And uh, you're also a mindfulness <laughs> coach, instructor, yeah. right? Yes. You know? And a partridge in a pear tree, right? Exactly. So, so all these things have initials that you put after your name. They must be the longest <laughs> set of initials. I, I don't. I leave the initials off usually, but uh, I find it gets confusing because I spend more time when I see someone's name with initials trying to look up to see what they all mean because they a lot of times some are so specialized. So I usually I usually just go by Danielle. I don't think it should be AVSP, a very special person. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. You're going to make me cry. <laughs> well, I know that happens easy, too, because you're very <laughs> sensitive to that you care about things. Well, let's focus on this remarkable trilogy. Um, it is uh, something that I remember you talking to me about, you know, when we, we've been working together now for 10 years and uh, that it was sort of like a little seed that you had in your head and. And uh, I said, well, you know, Daniel, I've been writing an, a novel, too, but it's been eight years and it isn't finished and I haven't looked at it in five years and what, whatever. And but so the discipline here and the commitment is just just remarkable. So the data collectors. All right. So it's three books. I each has their own title. I know. Right. And so you'll fill us in. So tell us what is it about? OK, in the nutshell, it's about intergalactic real estate. So what does that mean? (laughs) So the data collectors or data collectors, there's a huge ongoing argument about whether it's data or data. So I tend to flip back and forth, but um, the data collectors live on an Earth-like planet 
And they're here trying to collect information about us, about our wildlife, flora, fauna, our environment, um, our, our eating habits, everything to, to help us figure out why the human race is dying off. Because according to the premise of the book, we once occupied many planets on many solar systems, and now we seem to be reduced to Earth, and Earth is not doing so well. So they want to help us. However, there are also special interest groups from neighboring sections, I call them, or planets, that would rather see us die off sooner rather than later, uh, because you know we have some natural resources that uh, they might want. So they might want to occupy Earth. So it's kind of a, uh, it's been described as an intergalactic space opera with a little romance. <laughs> space opera. I love that. Well, I have, uh, I have gotten through two. I haven't gotten through the third one yet. And uh, I am just intrigued. Normally, uh, as a physician and someone who had to read so much for work, I, I haven't read even a lot of fiction, actually, but sci-fi for sure not. And I think this is more than sci-fi. If you'd have to ask me, I think it's extremely allegorical and, and it is, it is uh, writing about things. Who knows? We have yet to discover, but it could very well be out there. And it is extremely allegorical. Now, now, uh, can I zero in for a minute? You and I have been working with Teresa and, and the whole Masterpiece group on uh, on about healthy longevity, about uh, ageism, about lifestyle and its importance. So there's some so there's some overlapping themes, are there not, between the data, data collectors and Masterpiece? Absolutely. <laughs> Um, so I actually started working with Masterpiece in 2010. So uh, 2022 in March, it's going to be 12 years. But you and I started working together um, when Live Long Die Short came out in December of 2013. And and I think it's our working together that really helps me hone in and, and made me much more aware of the themes surrounding ageism and stereotypes about people who age and even stereotypes about gender roles and where we fit in society. So I was really mindful of those things as I was writing the trilogy. Your characters are so different than uh, what we on this planet portray, how we portray older adults and their role and in society and uh, how, how we value them. And so your characters are much different. Yeah, I I very purposely I very purposefully wanted the characters to not all be in their twenties or thirties. So they range anywhere from teenagers up through hundreds. Uh, their their lifespans on certain planets are just a lot longer. And the reason being, and I can give you an example. You know, I got tired of reading books that showed older people as frail and cranky and crotchety. Um, there was one book that Amazon recommended that I would like. So I read it. It was a romantic comedy and it's a, a woman in her early thirties, but they're making this joke. She goes on a cruise and she ended a relationship. And so she ends up uh, sitting at a table with a man who's 50 years old. And the joke, the recurring joke is, oh, well, if she doesn't find someone, Sue, she's going to end up with this old man. So my first thought was, Maybe Amazon did not know their audience very well if they suggested it to me or what our perceptions were of older older people. And second, at 49 years old, 50 didn't strike me as terribly old for a 30-something year old. No, next year you can be a member of AARP. That used to be a badge of oldness, but it is not anymore. So I really wanted in the data collectors for the characters to be doing interesting stuff in their 40s, in their 70s, in their 80s, and, and really try to, to be mindful of that. And also, even in the classroom, um, when they're at Tara, the Terrestrial Academy of Research and Awareness, they don't just have teenagers. They have 50, 60 and plus coming back for education and starting new careers. And that was very purposeful. And I can thank Masterpiece for its years of influence that, that got me thinking about that. There are many things in this book that I'd like to see brought to reality here on this planet in order to, to save not only our planet, but to save our society and, uh, and work towards a healthy longevity. Well, you and I just finished, you know, we, we do lots of content. We write lots of content for Masterpiece. We have huge amount that you and I have had such a pleasure writing and the whole team writes. And uh, we just finished a program, an intergenerational program that was focused on women 
and their evolving role in society. I see some some of that in this this story in the Data Collectors trilogy. I tried to. It, it is heavily focused on women's roles because I happen to be a woman, um, but I did try to pay attention to the men as well. And what I tried to do is, in, in many of the roles, if it were typically a young male filling the role, I would fill it with an older woman. Or so, for example, uh, Commander Royce is very old, and yet she's a soldier. And she's little and nobody questions her authority. Um, you have uh, Dr. Willa is a female, well-respected doctor. You have Renanette who runs, who's the director of the makerspace, which is technologic, women in technology you don't hear as much about. And she's the director. I made uh, Pelamar and Mallory. They own a costume shop. They're men. Um, I had a male nurse and it, and I didn't do it every in every single case. What I was seeking to do was normalize the fact that we don't have to fit into those stereotypes. Women are the teachers and the nurses. Men are the doctors and the scientists, that there is much overlap and there should be. There absolutely should be. And then next year, you and I plan to do the same with the topic, with the focus on men namely men through the ages and how they're perceived in the uh, in the media and their roles. And so we're, we'll be doing that one. And I, I plan to have a big role in that since I'm one of them. We want to continue to provide information that is valuable and reliable to our listeners. We welcome your comments and suggestions for topics that are important to you. Please see the description of this episode to contact the Brightside team. Your characterization, it is incredible. Uh, it is the depth of the, your characterization, your character portrayal, and the, the number of characters. I don't know. You must have a big board somewhere. You can't keep this all straight in your head. Right. Well, if you look at uh, the print version of the book, there actually is a list of the characters in each one. And, and if I'm being honest, by the time I got to book three and I started describing the eye color of a character, sometimes I had to go reference it myself. Like, did I give them gray eyes or blue eyes? <laughs> yeah. And with the audio book, what was that accent they spoke with? Because you did the, uh, the females for the audio. So I purposefully did not want um, I wanted when you listen to the audio to be able to tell the distinct character voices so I can hear them in my head when I'm typing, but it, they didn't translate when I started working on audio. So I uh, had the opportunity to co-narrate with Graham Mack, who's a producer and uh, audio book narrator and broadcaster. So he did all the male voices. And he has a lot more experience doing those different character voices. So for me, I added accents, but I didn't want them to necessarily be distinctly French or German or, you know, Caribbean. I gave elements of it just to identify the different characters because they're aliens. They can be from anywhere. Um, so I, I did download some accent help for actors and tried to go through a few courses just so that I would work on how I position my mouth, how I would position um, where I was coming from in the throat, is it high in the mouth or deep in the chest? And um, so I had a lot of a lot of fun with them. They were difficult, but. Uh, you know, I've written uh, uh, fiction with some characters and the, your identification with the characters must have been so enriched by that. They t they have a mind of their own. In fact, uh, um, in one point in our first interview that that Graham had interviewed me and he said, Ivan started pronouncing things wrong. He said, it wasn't me. The character got it wrong because you get you get <laughs> so immersed in in the characters that the voice changes. Um, there were some characters that came out without me, you know, wanting them to like I have Kiki and he kind of talks like this the whole time. And I find myself making these movements as I'm talking about her, you know, or um, uh, there was Amy, who we hate. <laughs> You'll discover her in the third book. It's she, I, just, I opened my mouth and she came out and she sounded like this. And I was like, all right, that's her voice. <laughs> so some of them just happened on their own. Some were very purposeful. Um, but yes, it was, uh, it was interesting to get into those uh, roles. The closest I've ever gotten to method acting, I guess. <laughs> so when we're talking about strong female characters, um, Moksha comes to mind. Now she's a peace-loving assassin, which doesn't seem to go <laughs> hand in hand. 
Um, and there's a scene where she's teaching Lucine how to fight and defend herself. And so I actually have a fight scene in there. Now, I come from a background. I, I studied martial arts for about a decade back in the day, and I wanted this to be accurate as I was writing it. So I'm kind of thinking through the choreography. So my poor husband, I said, could you help me block this out? And he had this look of fear on his face. I said, don't worry, honey, I promise I won't hurt you. So he, my long suffering husband actually in the living room, let me block out the fight scene with him to make sure that the movement made sense when I wrote it. Wow. Yeah. Well, um, you use some words block out. No, but what else did you use? My long suffering husband. Hopefully he wasn't, you know, that you didn't do something. I didn't hurt him <laughs> once. <laughs> Great story. And that's the, you know, and, you know, let's hear it for John. What a supportive uh, spouse you have there. And uh, so it's, it's fitting that there be a story or that in some ways he's in this book. Oh, he's in the book more than that. He's Ivan. That's a good character. So, uh, yeah, so uh, the only person who got that was John's dad. He was reading. He's like, oh, Ivan's John. So he he is a character of John, the, the tinkerer. And my husband's very much the the inventor. And he's much more likely to go to a party. And instead of bringing a bottle of wine or flowers, he would bring some bit of technology to put a tracker in your phone. Like that is just something he would do for <laughs> <laughs> so he's romantic in the non-classical sense and, and his relationship with Fatima um, nicely ties in with our relationship. It's almost as if I'm Fatima and he's Ivan. So we're, they're, they're running around in the background, but they're kind of us. <laughs> well, I'm going to rush out and finish the third one because I hadn't quite gotten through it. I had to do some travel and uh, and uh, but I'm, I'm I'm on it. I'm oh, actually okay. curious, Roger, do you have a favorite character? Well, you, you know, you got to go with Lucina for me because, you know, to see, you know, here's a here's a woman and she, she was born with certain powers, but she develops them, as you say. And she is such a such an important uh, I think the novel really revolves around her because of her her central role in what everyone wants to preserve Earth or to, to grab Earth. And so, yeah, she's she's the one for me. And you know what? And she's a perfect example of environment. What do we talk about with Masterpiece? How she's in the wrong environment and she's working, you know, basically in a minimum wage job in New York, afraid to go anywhere. because She doesn't know what's you know, she feels like somebody's out to get her, but she doesn't know who to, you know, meeting her friend Fatima to meeting Cepheus and Ivan and and connecting with Tanager and all of a sudden a different environment, see how she grows and, and blossoms as a person. So another theme that I didn't even think about as we're talking about it with with Masterpiece. Absolutely. And uh, we have our null people on Earth. <laughs> uh, obviously by the name you know they're not the good ones in this story and uh but we have those who are so negative about um, our world uh, how we treat each other uh, i mean the, it, it was clear the the reference is there that, that we can do better than to uh to have the nulls tell the whole <laughs> story or rule the roost so it's absolutely well i'll tell you i uh I have a friend who is an astronaut, and he, when he looked down on the Earth, he said he was forever changed. And I think if you read these stories, you will be forever changed on how you view our Earth, how we treat each other. Uh, you'll see uh, science fiction in an entirely different role. Great success is ahead, I'm sure. But it's, ladies and gentlemen, the Data Collectors Trilogy. Danielle Pai, come on, go get it. In any form, audio, ebook, print, do it. Thank you, Ted. You've been listening to Dr. Roger and Friends, The Bright Side of Longevity. If you like the show, please rate and review, and be sure to click to follow.